and welcome. Um, I'm Doug Davis. Uh, Theodore and I are going to be talking today about mining large biometric omics data inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and with that, let me go ahead and hand it over to Theodore so we can go ahead and introduce himself and then kick it off. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Doc, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here and to present the work that we're doing at European Molecular Biology Laboratory, or EMBL. And EMBL is an international research organization focused on life sciences. It has 27 member states, mainly focused in Europe and with different sites in Heidelberg headquarters, but also in many other cities throughout, throughout the Europe. And um, I present here the work of the team that I'm leading at EMBO Heidelberg, which is focusing on developing new methods for life sciences. And here uh, you see our faces, you see who we are. We're a team of scientists, but also software engineers and computer scientists. And what we are working on, we are trying to develop methods to really improve the use of this new technology called spatial metabolomics, for life sciences in, with applications in biology and medicine. So I will not go much into detail what spatial metabolomics is about, but you can see our scientific officer, Prasad, taking a, a very thin section of a tissue and putting it on a glass slide and putting it into this uh, instrumentation, which is called imaging mass spectrometry. And there, there, there will be some magic happening there, producing very unique data. Why is it important? Because Currently, this technology is becoming essential for biology, for medicine, for drug development, across a variety of biological questions, but also diseases such as cancer, diabetes, NASH, and also developing novel types of therapies like immunotherapy. So, and the technology per se, and also the tools and the software that I'll show you next, is used by scientists from across the globe, from universities, university of hospitals, from government organizations, pharma, contract research organizations, startups, you name it. So let me get you one glimpse into uh, what this data, spatial metabolomics data can represent and what the challenges are behind. So first of all, it's very special data because you can think of this as an image, but not with just three RGB channels, but with over 10,000 channels. And you can start thinking that, oh yeah, so then probably this data is pretty big. And yes, it is. Just from one tissue section or from a sample, we can easily generate more than 10 gigabytes. And often we generate the data, which is close to one terabyte coming from one experiment, which we're generating in a few hours. Why is it so big? Because every channel corresponds to a particular molecule. And here I'm showing you just one example from a public data set from a mouse section, which is used by Genentech, a pharma company in the USA for drug development. And what you are looking at here, you are looking at localization of four different molecules across this tissue section. And why is it important? Because by getting this information, we understand where does the drug go? What does it do? Does it have any side effects? And if there are side effects happening, where action with which organ they are associating? And this is just one application of this technology. So our team at Amble, um, over the past years, we have developed Metaspace. And Metaspace is a very core of this presentation. So let me take one slide to explain it. So it is a cloud engine and also a knowledge base where a lot of users from across the globe, they put their data in. There is some computation going on there on high performance computing. They get images, they look through the images, they exchange, they publish them and so on and so forth. And they also allow others to, uh, uh, to use them and reuse as public data. So we have a number of submissions, more than 10,000 submissions over the past three years, many users, many labs, most of the labs in our field use this essential resource. They publish results, they get new biology, they get new medicine. So it's pretty pretty important platform in our field, which enables data analysis, data reuse, data sharing, and overall open science in biology and medicine. So let me show you how it looks, uh, just to get you the feeling there about what's real behind it. So you can, you can go to metaspace2020.eu, you can select one of the projects or folders that we have there. Here, it's exactly that project with the public data from pharma companies. You can pick one data set here, 
And uh, once you pick it, then you will see a lot of molecules which were found by our engine hidden in this data. And now you can flip, uh, 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 go th through this data molecule by molecule. It will visualize it. You can share it. You can un understand, interpret, and so on and so forth. It's pretty user-friendly technology and platform. So recently, we got some need and appetite for new computer technologies used uh, to be used in Metaspace. And why? Because the platform is actually growing now. So there is a pretty good uptake in the field, and there is also growth in the number of submissions. And in particular, over the past half a year, we experienced super linear growth in the number of submissions. And also, what's very special about our processing is that the submissions, they come irregularly. So sometimes there is like hundreds of them. Sometimes there is nothing. So we experienced a few pain points in our software system, and one of is deployment delay. So scientists, they want to see results immediately, and if we need to wait for the deployment of some system, we used Apache Spark in the past, it's actually not very uh, convenient. The second one is infrastructure management and queue management. If some data set got stuck in the queue, we need to go, we need to fix it, because, because it, it's kind of a painstaking process. And also resource planning because we don't really know how many data sets will be coming because, again, it's used by the community and sometimes there is demand, sometimes not. All this brought us to, uh, uh, to motivate, motivated us to actually search for a new solution, in particular, because our computing pro problem and uh, uh, process is embarrassingly parallel. So it was very interesting and kind of like happy coincidence for us that we were invited into a project, Cloud Button, uh, a European project, academic funded by European Commission, to work in particular together with IBM to, to co-develop and apply user-friendly serverless framework. And here you see the leading people who are working on this project, Gil Vernick from IBM and Lachlan Stewart from our team. And what they've been working on to apply the technology, which was developed by Gil and others called LithOps, which is serverless computing framework, and a key result in this project to apply it for our system Metaspace. And in the next, you will see how these three pieces are connected. Our platform, Cloud Engine Metaspace, LithOps as serverless framework, and Code Engine from IBM. Over to you, Doug. Thank you, Theo. Um, okay, before we actually start talking about a little bit of a deep dive into Code Engine itself, I think it's important to talk a little bit about sort of what led up to the creation of Code Engine itself as a platform in which to run different types of workloads. And you actually saw a lot of this already with what Theo was saying. And I'd like to look at it sort of like lessons learned or the state of the community kind of a thing, right? We realized that users or developers really want to focus on producing value, either for their customers or to get their job done, whatever that actually is, right? they don't really want to work on managing and setting up infrastructure, right? To them, infrastructure is just a means to an end. It's just a tool that they need to use to get their job done. For the most part, they don't even want to think about it, right? They're there to get something finished and completed, okay? So the entire idea of being asked to manage, learn, whatever you want to call it, the, uh, the infrastructure is really, like I said on here, an undesirable burden, right? It's a nuisance to them for, for the most part because it's, it's a distraction, okay? Now, from this Knative, I'm sorry, not Knative, from the cloud native community perspective, um, the, the, the community itself is also starting to realize this as well, right? Managing infrastructure is actually hard, regardless of what that infrastructure is, whether it's Spark computing, like a lot of AI systems or and machine learning type systems use, or Kubernetes itself. Those are wonderful systems, but they're, they're actually kind of complex, especially for people who aren't necessarily developers, right? They're, they're people who have other jobs to get done, like research scientists and stuff, like we're seeing, right? So it, it's difficult for them to, to come on board to, to actually use these things. And of course, there's this other problem where there are many different platforms out there to get your job done, right? You have generic Kubernetes, you have things like a serverless environment and stuff like that. And each platform is actually going to present a different set of features. And with those different features also come different sets of constraints. So oftentimes, people feel the need to conform their design of their workload to the need to what the platform sort of boxes them into and that's a bit of a problem because that means they don't necessarily pick the right solution for their job okay and so in our point of view really what it means is developers should code not manage infrastructure if you get down to the brass tacks of the thing okay and ibm or from ibm's side we have a 
we have a better solution to try to solve this. Okay, and that's what code engine is all about. So, we looked at this problem and said, what if at a high level the developer could basically focus on just their workload, meaning their function, their application, their batch job, whatever the workload is, as long as they can containerize it in some fashion, that's all they should really focus on. Okay. Now, whether they give that to us as source code or as a pre-built container image, doesn't really matter. They, are, they choose what they want to give it to us, right? But along with that, if they give us the runtime semantics that they want, right? Something like, does it scale or not? You know, how many, what are, what are the minimum number of instances there? Things like that, right? Those are the runtime semantics. And that, that's the only set of input into a platform, right? Then under the covers, if they give us a container image, we'll just use that directly when we deploy the workload. If they give us source code, we'll build it for them, right? And that's what you see today with some platforms like uh, platforms of service, functions, and stuff like that. Right? But then, of course, obviously, we take those runtime behaviors, and all three of those variants feed into the actual cloud-native workload engine itself or hosting environment itself. Right? And for the most part, the user's job is done. Right? It's now the workload's job to properly host and manage the workload, the infrastructure that goes around it, and everything else. Now, obviously, that's not quite all you need. Right? As a workload, I'm sorry, yeah, you, oftentimes workloads need to actually connect up to things like managed services, so we need to make sure you can do that. Um, a lot of these things are going to respond to incoming messages and stuff like that, so obviously you have to have networking that does uh, automatic setup for you, scaling, traffic splitting, if you're going to do uh, blue-green deployment type stuff or upgrades, that kind of stuff. If you're connecting up to event producers, you're going to have to have some sort of event orchestration engine in there, even in the simple case of deliver the event just once to one particular uh, destination. That's the simple case. But what if you want that one event to get fanned out to lots of different services you have running in there, right? You need some sort of orchestrator at some point. But then, of course, as the backbone of all of this, you, of course, need security and compliance built into the system so that the end user or the developer doesn't need to think about it. It's just there, right? So this was sort of our dream platform from an abstract perspective. But of course, the main point here is the stuff in uh, sort of this pinkish box on the hand side, that's all a developer needs to worry about, right? They just worry about their workload from a coding perspective, a container image perspective, and what is the runtime behavior they want. Everything else on the right-hand side should be basically hidden from them and just managed under the covers for them. And that's exactly what Code Engine is doing for them. And that's what you see Theo basically talking about here. Okay, so let me just sort of quickly mention in a little more detail exactly what Code Engine does for you. Because Code Engine is a managed hosted environment in the cloud. Okay, and with Code Engine, you give us your source code, and what do you get? For applications, meaning things that actually respond to HTTP requests, you get an internet exposed, securely hosted workload. Now, if you don't want it to be internet exposed, you don't have to if you don't want to. You can make it private, which means it's only available to other things inside your workspace. Okay. That, that workload that will automatically scale up and down based upon the load coming in, even down to zero, which means if it's not being used at that exact moment, scales down to zero, you don't pay for it. You have zero downtimes for upgrades, right? We'll slowly shift the traffic over from your old version to the new one. So your users of your application never see a, the shift over or never see a downtime between the shift, okay? If you happen to have a workload that doesn't respond to HP requests, this is what we typically call batch jobs, right? These are jobs where your container comes up does a particular thing and then goes away when it's done. Data processing type stuff, exactly what Theo is doing in his workloads, right? Those are batch jobs. You can scale those up, up as well, right? Just tell how big you want, what size, what is the size of your workload. We'll scale it, bring up the resources. When it's done, scale it back down. You don't need to worry about it. Just tell us what you want, okay? Obviously, you can then connect the host of services, but of course, one of the key things here is you only pay when your code is actually running. Right? Your batch job scales down to zero because it's, not, it's all done. You stop paying. Your uh, internet-facing application that's, re that's receiving requests or events, only pay for when it's actually running and processing those events. Very important for people. Okay? Of course, there's a, there's a simplified user experience around all this, which we, which we obviously really like. And so it's, that's, that's part of the height of the infrastructure from you. But obviously, you're going to need to do some customizations. And these are those runtime semantics that I talked about, right? How do you want your application to scale from a min and max perspective? When do you want it to scale, right? What is your resource usage, memory, CPU, those kind of stuffs? How do you want the traffic splitting handled? All those kind of things you still have available to you, right, through our simplified user experience, okay? And of course, 
because it's all in one particular platform, regardless of the type of workload you have, applications, functions, source code, batch jobs, they all live together, which means you get built-in security from a networking perspective. They can all talk to one another securely, and you don't have to figure out how to make those happen because they're not on separate platforms anymore. Okay? And just to sort of wrap this thing up here, because I really like this slide, I think it presents everything in a nice, simple fashion, right? With Code Engine, as a developer, you can deploy any type of application, whether it's a container, batch job, your source code, your function, on a single unified platform without provisioning, managing, securing, configuring anything in the infrastructure, meaning clusters, networks, VMs, certificates, you name it. It's all hidden from you. You don't need to touch it. And best of all, you only pay when your application or workload is actually active. Okay? And with that, I believe I'm done. Let me go ahead and hand it back to Theo to kind of wrap this up. Thanks, Doug. So let me wrap up this talk. So I would like to share our story and how actually both stories of us developing this serverless uh, uh, technology for our needs and the code engine, which was recently released, converged into uh, this trio. So what we, what we got and what we learned out of this is that right now we have implemented technology which provides scalable solution for science and our users from science, from academia, from industry. For us, it was um, very nice and also will be very useful in the future because right now we have less infrastructure overhead, overhead in terms of our time, in terms of cost, and in terms of delays as well. And also we don't need to plan for the resources ahead. And this is very important for us because we can actually use and provide the system to our users as they go. And I think it, it was very nice that um, we got this opportunity to work with a very talented team at IBM who not only set up code engine, which, which is great for us because it provided us access to native support for serverless, but also the on-demand scaling, definitely pay as you go, very, uh, very handy feature and uh, easier for us to code because there are no minimal artificial constraints on memory and CPU. And this link uh, uh, by technology a framework, LithOps, and I'm pretty sure there are many other technologies which allow to use the power of code engine. But for us, LithOps was instrumental because it kind of removed all this bottleneck and simplified the coding for us, allowed us to really hide the complexity and focus our business logic, actually on scientific uh, process and scientific algorithms, and also hide the complexity of the runtime platform and all the overhead connected to it. With this, I would like to thank uh, everyone at the IBM team who uh, contributed to this work, and particularly Gil Wernick. And it was also a pleasure to, uh, to work on this with the rest of IBM team, with a doc on, on this work. And if you are interested, you can check out our joint blog post, Decoding Dark Molecular Matter in Spatial Metabolomics with the IBM Cloud Functions which was for the previous generation, and now it will re replace decoding the dark molecular matter with a IBM code engine. Thank you for your attention. All right, so as Theo said, we're going to jump into the Q&A now. Uh, just one final note. Uh, if you are interested in code engine, you can stop by the IBM booth here at KubeCon, and we'll answer any of your questions for you. And of course, there's a link here on the screen. You can actually go play with it yourself at cloud.ibm.com slash code engine. Okay. And with that, we'll now jump into the live Q&A portion. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.